Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. So you can hear us. So we have been looking forward to presenting this topic on what it means to be conscious. And you might put in parentheses, er, conscious er, a little more conscious. More conscious. <laughs> because it's not a black and white thing. Uh, consciousness is a, a ladder and we can become more and more conscious over time. And we can enjoy that process of climbing the ladder of consciousness without judgment and becoming more and more conscious over time. And that's key, to do yes. it without judgment. And that is conscious. <laughs> and that is conscious. And, and we want to say before we get started, thank you, thank you, thank you to our very conscious teacher, John Jones, who has been a model of consciousness for us um, and really the embodiment on this planet for us of uh, consciousness. And, and also, we must say, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who has also been that for us in his YouTube videos. Ramana Maharishi. Ramana Maharishi. Uh, Sri Nisargadatta, who wrote the book, I Am That. Uh, Ramana Maharishi wrote the book, Who Am I? all excellent works on, on what it means to be conscious. Uh, we are here as guides, as facilitators, as teachers uh, that are equal to all beings and things. And we simply want to help share what we've learned about consciousness and we found that, that that journey has been really wonderful and, and enlightening and inspirational and, and perhaps coming from our, a time where, where life and things may have looked bleak or, or meaningless in a way or empty, <laughs> funny words, uh, Consciousness has helped us tremendously experience love and connection and, and uh, spirit and miracles uh, in this world. And, and it has helped us transform our, our lives from our careers, our relationship. Uh, it's, it's helped me personally transform in so many ways and of course consciousness can your consciousness and and your attainment of higher consciousness can do that for you it can help you with whatever it is that you want to achieve so in that process we invite you throughout the workshop to ask a lot of questions i can't read them because uh, the lettering is too small for me on the screen that said dexter uh, will read any question that you ask about how to evolve your consciousness, how to become more conscious, and uh, we'll be very happy to answer your questions. It's very important to us. Uh, like Dexter was saying, we're here to facilitate as guides, as equals to you, and it's very important to us that um, whatever you are interested in and what, however we can help you, that we do that. That's mm -hmm. our uh, focus and our intention. Yes, and, and Juan, who says, so excited and honored to listen to you again. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. We're so honored that you're here again. And, uh, and exactly what you said, love, please do ask questions. Our consciousnesses now are interacting, and, and we want to hear your questions, and we want to help you specifically, and you are not taking away from the process. And whatever questions you have will help the collective so, so please do ask. And they facilitate the unfoldment of consciousness. Yes, however it is meant to unfold. Yes. So, uh, in addition to that, I'd like to make an announcement. Um, probably middle of next week, I'm going to uh, release a new meditation called I Love My Life or Loving Your Life. And... Um, it's very much about being conscious and making that conscious choice to love your life. Because when there is consciousness, there is love. 
love of self, love of life, love of others, love of all. <laughs> and, and that is sometimes counterintuitive. Sometimes people who are very conscious, and there's, there's really very few on earth that are very conscious. That is a very highly attained state that, that, takes, that can take lifetimes to, to reach. And, and when we speak of, for example, Krishnamurti, who was very conscious, if you watch videos of him, if you were to interact with him, you would see that there is a seriousness to him. A seriousness. He takes certain things very seriously. And when you watch his videos, you might, you might first get the impression, oh, he's kind of, he's a bit rude. <laughs> and, and one of the greatest poets of all time, Khalil Gibran, said about Krishnamurti, who was a very conscious being, one of the greatest poets said, that when, when he was in his presence, he, he thought to himself, he felt to himself, surely the Lord of love has come. <laughs> and, and anyone, if you would read his biography, for instance, of uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti or other, um, other videos where people talk about him, people who have met him, uh, outside of the serious talks that he gave where he explored consciousness with, with people by being very present, and therefore seemingly serious, uh, not in the way that we look at seriousness, really serious from the perspective of, of presence, of, of um, precision, of focus, of intentionality. They have all said that he is the, such a loving, kind, gentle being. So um, we're going to start with a short practice. And before we do, we'd like to invite you, if you enjoy this workshop, uh, to give donations, uh, to support our work, to support all the free meditations that we uh, share on Insight Timer and on other platforms, and also to support Insight Timer. We are very grateful to them uh, that we can um, do these workshops and also um, share our meditations on this platform. So let's begin by connecting to our intention to become more conscious because ultimately everything in the universe starts with an intention. So the intention for something to be, the intention for something to, um, to be created into experience. So if you'll close your eyes and as much as you can, let go of any tension, any contraction in your physical body. Notice any thoughts as they come up. And simply choose to let go of everything as it arises. Not holding on to anything, opening yourself up in the present moment, to the present moment. Placing your awareness in the area of your heart center. Connecting to your breath in that space. Connecting to your presence in that space. Choosing to be in the space of your heart. And as you maintain your awareness in your heart, if you feel or see or intend for the light of consciousness to feel the space of your heart, so you may feel it entering from your crown or directly into your heart, however you experience it, there's no rule, there's no right way to do it. Simply connect to the light of consciousness. The light of infinite love, infinite wisdom. And as you connect to this light of consciousness, as you connect to consciousness, 
if you will intend for this light of consciousness to fill your entire being so that every part of your body, every part of your mind, every part of your being is soaking in this light, filled with this light, the light of consciousness. Intending to be fully resonant with consciousness for any obscurations in your being to be filled with this light so that they may clear, they may release and there might be more light in your being and feel this light and celebrate it in your heart feeling grateful to yourself for making that choice, for having this intention to resonate with consciousness, to be one with it. To let go of anything that isn't it, anything you've recorded in the past, any ego, any identity, simply being one with consciousness right now and repeating the statement I choose to become exponentially more conscious right now. I choose to become exponentially more conscious right now. Repeating this statement and really connecting to what that feels like and what that means. I choose to become exponentially more conscious right now and as you repeat the statement if you find yourself essentially inspired to verbalize this intention in a different way please feel free to do so for instance you could say every day I'm becoming more conscious whatever it is for you your own experience your own commitment to becoming more conscious. I am consciousness. Consciousness and I are one. And feel that. What that experience is for you. It's unique to you your own personal experience of consciousness, your own commitment to being conscious, seeing the benefits of it within your own being, within your own life, within your relationships, why you're choosing to become more conscious, to resonate with consciousness. Connecting to this why, to your intention, and bringing your hands to your heart, anchoring this intention in your heart to resonate, to be one with consciousness, to be conscious. And then feeling grateful again to yourself, to consciousness, to your intention, your commitment. And then bringing this into the present moment, into this workshop, allowing you to align yourself with this intention right now. And you can open your eyes. So if anyone wants to share what this experience, affirming this intention, connecting to consciousness, feeling consciousness, feeling your whole being with consciousness, what that was like for you. Ah, 
extremely peaceful. Peace, oh, how about that? <laughs> Paula says extremely peaceful. Darren says peace. Consciousness is far more peaceful than unconsciousness. One moment, let me read another comment. Oh, another, Rachel with peace, Heather with internal peace, TLO with so peaceful, Juan, liberating, true, beautiful intention, Juan, to be more conscious. And the sun came out for Liz just as the meditation started, beautiful. The sun brings light. So, and, and we had a question, I saw a question, and we will answer it. So let us speak for a few moments about all the comments talking about peace and, and why consciousness brings inner peace. And let us also blend into that discussion the comment from TLO. Hello from San Francisco. I often, hello San Francisco. I often find myself being overtaken by the thinking mind. Well, that must be just you. I, <laughs> I've never heard that before, but we'll try to help you with that. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> this happens when I'm feeling overwhelmed, mostly with work. So let's talk about consciousness, inner peace, and this comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and thank you for this comment because the workshop is very much about that, meaning the attainment of consciousness is a, is a state where we feel more peace and the thinking mind um, and all of the thoughts generated release. by the thinking mind can release and we can get out of the analytical mind and out of our own way and experience ourselves in consciousness, in peace. So, so to think is not to be conscious. And that's, that's a common misunderstanding. Understandable because the terms are a bit confusing. Like we talk of the conscious mind and the subconscious mind and the unconscious mind. So we think, okay... Well, my conscious mind is the one that I can sort of hear, and the voices in my head, those are my conscious mind, and my subconscious and unconscious mind are, you know, the, the thoughts and stuff that I can't hear. And so then we end up thinking that consciousness is literally what we think. So well, let me ask you this. If, if we're thinking that, you know, everybody's bad and wrong and, and nothing is good in the world and or we're stressed or worried at work because we have deadlines and there's different things that we're projecting onto the task that we're doing at work, for instance. Yeah, so we're projecting a lot of, you know, things we don't want, a lot of negative scenarios. Uh, if we're doing that in relationship, right, feeling like, oh, you know, my partner never is caring about me or anything that starts with always or never. Oh, they're always this way or they never do this. Or this always happens to me, and this never happens for me. So any absolute statements like that, any emotionally reactive modes we get into, feeling sad or angry or, or hatred or frustrated or bored. Depressed. And all the thoughts that happen at the same time. So certainly that's happening in our conscious minds, right? That is happening in our conscious mind. We, are, we can hear those voices, we're aware of it. And is that consciousness? Is that a conscious process? Or where is it coming from? Where are our thoughts coming from? I like Anne's comment, oh, dot, 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 the <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that all human beings they get this. Like, all human beings can relate to each other when it comes to their relationship to their own thoughts. Every human being tends to struggle with their own mind. <laughs> and it's almost like our minds start to run us rather than our hearts and our souls sort of running our minds. 
we really use the mind so much and, and overuse it, probably. Spending so much time thinking about the past and the future. We've become addicted to this. So are these thoughts that we have about the past and the future and problems and stresses and worries and concerns and poss possible problems that could happen and, and pain and suffering and, and, and comparing ourselves to others and comparing ourselves to what we don't have, thinking about what we don't have, thinking about what we want, are all of these thoughts consciousness? Is that consciousness? So, consciousness means presence. It means being in the present moment and experiencing reality, experiencing what is, again, like Dexter said, on a spectrum. So, if we're projecting, if we're going through a mechanical process of thought, Jiddu Krishnamurti does a really good job at uh, explaining how thought is mechanical, meaning that as mm -hmm. through observance, he's observed, and also working with quantum physicists, uh, they've been able to show that it's a mechanical process. There's a chemistry to it, and there's a firing of the neurons, and there's, you know, um, energies in the body, and they might not call them energies. They might talk about um, different um, hormones and different uh, mechanisms in the body that uh, send signals to the brain and then the brain then generates you know hormones and and different chemicals uh, that reaffirm to the body that yes the experience that it is it is being experienced is indeed true <laughs> and it's like a cycle and it's very mechanical and and it, what's important to understand is that it is very subconscious meaning that we are actually reacting and making interpretations about reality based on the past. Thought is based on the past. It's not a process of being in the present moment, being able to perceive what is, to perceive reality as it is. It's, and, and, and by the way, consciousness uh, in contrast to thought or uh, even to energy is faster than all of that, meaning that you receive downloads you are able to perceive what is without going through a process of comparison, of remembering, of um, projecting things that you've understood from the past, books that you've read. It really, it, all the information is right here in the present moment. It's there. And you've probably had experiences of clarity like that. You've probably had moments where things were very clear. Why the mind is quiet without thought. And there is clarity and understanding and wisdom and discernment. And those are wonderful moments. And, and we can stretch those moments out. We can have them more and more often. That being said, we usually get pulled away from that state by our own minds. And so essentially but what is unresolved in the subconscious the more clear your subconscious is the less you've accumulated recorded the more you've released things from the past the more present you become and the less you have of this bubbling up of those energies from the past that generate thoughts so typically the way we go about life is from moment to moment, we go from one part of ourselves to another. And in each, each part seems to have a different feeling and a different perspective about life. So we might go into one part during work that's just all about getting work done. And then when we get home, we might want to relax, enjoy some leisure, go for a nice walk, and our mind keeps thinking about work. Well, that's because we're still in that part. Okay, then we might go on a vacation and disconnect. And then we might have, you know, a nice time. And, and now we're in another part. We're in a vacation part. And then we might start thinking about our relationship and, and, and feel um, like maybe, you know, it's not where we want it to be. And then we're in another part. 
And then we might start thinking about finances and taxes. And then we might feel like, oh, I got to do taxes. Then we're in another part. Then we might get hungry and we might be like, I got to make food now. If I don't eat now, you know, and we might get grumpy about it. Then we're in another part. Another word for part is program. <laughs> from one program to another, from one habit to another, one pattern to another. The things that we've learned and been conditioned into over time. So, and I'm seeing your questions and we're giving, we're going to answer them all. And thank you for the excellent questions. We're right now laying the, the bricks, the foundation to do that. And it is by you understanding this foundation that it will allow you to then go ahead and clear those things. Heather says, thank you. Love what you are speaking on right now. Thank you, Heather. So we go from part or program, right, to part or program, from part to part, program to program. Or subconscious. Even if it comes into our consciousness, it bubbles up into our consciousness. That said, it's not a, a, a process of consciousness being in the present it all comes from what we've recorded and internalized yes exactly from the past right so these different parts of ourselves that we go into are programs they are ways we've learned to operate they are these these reactions that we've recorded to life so maybe someone who thinks about work a lot grew up with parents who thought about work a lot or saw a movie in childhood with a business person who had a lot of success and they said, I want to be like that. And in watching that movie, they recorded, oh, well, business people who are successful, they think a lot about work. They think about work all the time. And then, so we pick up these different like personalities, these different ego identities, these different ways of being, these different parts and programs from parents, from teachers, from TVs, from, from TV shows and movies, from, from books. And, and then we try to live life in all these parts, wearing all these different hats, going from ego identity to ego identity. And that is all instead of being conscious. To be conscious is, is to not be in any part at all, to not be in any program at all. And for the... For the ego, that is scary because it means to be in the present moment without, without any um, s seeming like control strategy or safety strategy. To be in the present moment without using any thing that has been modeled for us in the past. To be in the present moment without any beliefs, expectations, judgments. And you might have heard this described by athletes, for instance, as being in the zone. And being in the zone is really to be in that, in that state of, of consciousness where we're very present to what is in the moment and very focused and very quiet. The mind is empty. We're just really just taking everything in. And when we're receiving the information from the environment, instead of it being processed through the lens of our programming, of our conditioning, of the lenses through which we experience reality, we're simply receiving the information and experiencing it. Uh, you may have experienced it also, for instance, if you um, know a little bit about Tantra, and I'm not talking about uh, Tantra as in the sexual uh, tantras, for instance, that are sometimes uh, taught uh, in the Western world. I'm talking about Tantra as a practice of, of presence and living, of, of consciousness, conscious living. And that can be applied for, to eating. So some people can uh, essentially um, choose to apply this conscious uh, process to conscious eating. So when they're eating, they're really present to the food. And they're so present that each bite of food instead of being something mechanical where they're thinking about work or they're worrying about um, uh, the food that they're eating and how it's affecting them or whatever else is on their mind, they're actually so aware of the, the, the food itself and they're having an experience almost like a newborn baby of the food. So that, you know, that 
process, I, I use the first the, the metaphor of the athlete being in the zone, and we can be in the zone, we can be fully present with any activity that we're doing. And that's an excellent example because just as in life, in, in sports, we are never in the same situation twice. We are always in a different, slightly different position on the field. The ball is coming at us in a slightly different way. Uh, the, in our orientation to other people is different. Other people are in different places. The, the time of day, the, the ground is a little softer or harder. The temperature a little hotter or colder. So, and life is like that. Every situation is new. Every moment is fresh. Every experience. And, and yet, the mind will try to record all past experiences and use that to navigate the present and, and also interpret the present moment through the lens of all past experiences. And so then... To try to attain truth. And so then we can have these layers upon layers, so lenses upon lenses upon lenses of those recordings from the past through which we experience the pre whatever experience we're having in the present moment and therefore not really be conscious, not really be present to what is in that moment. So you could say that the process of consciousness, part of it is the process of dissolving all of these recordings. Once again, um, going back to when the subconscious mind is clear, there is no thought. The mind is quiet. We're able to perceive reality. And a lot of spiritual masters have said that uh, when, the, when you've cleared your subconscious mind enough, most, most spiritual masters who have attained that level of, of clearing of their subconscious mind, they don't dream and they don't think because there's no content, there's no material. They're really experiencing the moment and every experience in the moment. Someone asked Krishnamurti in, a, in, a, in one of his talks, they said, so Krishnamurti, surely you think yourself a great man. And he, Krishnamurti goes, <laughs> he's slightly surprised by that. And, and, and then he asked, but what do you think of the Buddha? <laughs> That's what the, the, the audience member asked Krishnamurti. And Krishnamurti basically says, I do not think of myself, and I do not think of the Buddha. So, and then goes on to give a definition. The Buddha is a <laughs> religious figure from the, this century, etc., etc. Describing so what was. De just, yeah, describing. Yeah, so to be conscious... It's not just so. So let me respond to uh, some of the the response. And 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 yes, in in many ways, like a child, a child has a form of consciousness that is present, that is not so busy. The mind is not of a child is not busy thinking about problems in life and the bank account and the cars and and the house and and debt. And so a child is free, more free to to be in the present moment. And in that process, the child also, uh, until the age of seven, is in a state of hypnosis, meaning that they're recording everything. And then those programs start to get downloaded. So going from a state of openness and purity and, and presence to a state where a lot of the conditioning starts to... Um, which is interesting. We call seven the age of reason. <laughs> And it's the age where really we've downloaded enough programs that now we start mechanically saying, uh, oh, I understand. In this situation, mom and dad did this, so that's what you do. And now I'm reasonable. <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Not so, conscious. So to be conscious is actually to deconstruct all those programs, to heal, release, and send into the light all of those programs so that we can be still. We can experience silence. And then there's no layer between us and other people. There's no ego. There's no layer. There's no ego bubble that we surround ourselves in. There's no distortion of energy as it comes in that we then in misinterpret. There's no interpretation. So speaking of... And if it's okay, I'm 
please. I'm going to give a, a, a little metaphor. So when Dexter was descri describing the process of relationship dynamics, right, where we're in a bubble, you can look at when we're unconscious, when we're operating from our programs and our conditioning, it's a little bit like imagine two people playing tennis with each other and there's a wall in between them, a very tall wall, and they are blindfolded and also their ears are plugged. And this is how we communicate. This is how we relate to one another when we're unconscious. We're basically living in our own reality, in our own world, not really aware, not really conscious of, in this situation, in this metaphor, the person that we're playing tennis with, that we're communicating with, and in the world simply of everything, the plants, the, you know, the planet, everything around us. When we're in an unconscious state, we're not really um, perceiving the, the, the things around us accurately, precisely, comprehensively. And therefore, we are not able to interact uh, in a way that is um, grounded and a reflection of what is. Which, by the way, is problematic, and I'm going to bring that up because that can be... Um, it can be a motivator to become more conscious. When we're not operating consciously, we're creating karmas because we are doing things that are not in alignment, that are not in the present. And we're generating, you know, different beliefs and different fears and different um, dynamics between us and others, for instance, that are not a reflection of what is. Right. And so to be conscious is to to make the most informed choices because if when we're unconscious we're actually interacting with our internal image and this is this is nuanced so please follow with our internal image of the person that we're interacting with and that image is made up of our past experiences of our past with our mom and dad and influencers and all that stuff Ancestors, past lives, if you believe in them. Then we're not actually, if we're interacting unconsciously with that image, basically with a, our own projection of the person, then we're not interacting truly with each other. We're not seeing each other. So if a person, if, if Alessandrina were to say something and I were to feel hurt by it, well, it is, it is my projection of Alessandrina that has hurt me. And it is the projection of me that has been hurt. I don't know if you follow this. So if I were to then become unconscious and get upset at my projection of Alessandrina. And that, his projection of what I communicated. And my projection onto what she what communicated, communicated. Truly. And, and, and to, to get upset that, that supposedly she has hurt my projection of me then I'm, I'm really lost in unconsciousness. I'm, I'm literally f feeling and thinking and reacting and spending energy uh, on, on what isn't. And repeating his own programs, whatever he's been conditioned into, and therefore revalidating that instead of becoming conscious. And what if I'm doing that with work, with my career choice, with my exercise habits, with my eating habits? What if I'm doing that in so many ways, in, in so many in all aspects of, our of choices life. in life, then we're we're again creating karmas by operating in unconscious ways. So it's not problematic. It's just something to be aware of, so that we can become more conscious. We can know that when we continue to revalidate and to um, operate from the same programs, we're going to see the same results. So that's that's also. Another reason why people tend to experience the same things over and over again in their lives until they kind of like become conscious uh, that they are operating from a program, because if they're in a program, it's going to be projected onto everything. So some some people, for instance, in their career, oh, I'm failing, or you know, I'm not getting the job that I want over and over again. Some people in abundance, I don't have enough money, or you know, I I'm I'm not uh, able to create the abundance, the wealth that I want to experience in my life. And because those programs are present, 
and they're not operating from consciousness and choosing in the present moment intentionally what they want to create, what they want to experience, they're having the same you know, situation, the same experience over and over again. Mm -hmm. So by becoming more conscious, you become aware of the veil, of the invisible uh, obstacles, blocks in your life that came from unconsciousness and then you can clear them. And then you can be conscious, again, more conscious, right, on the spectrum. And then things flow more. Because in the universe, when we're conscious, there's a lot of flow. The energy is flowing all the time and there's a lot of creativity because we're not stuck in our programs. Excellent. So let's, let's address some questions. Okay. So, and I just, I'm going to address a comment. Hello, T. We recognize you. Welcome back. So notice triggers. They can be informative and be first step to recondition. Yes. So if you notice... When you're triggered, if you've gone into a negative emotion, if you're upset, if you're frustrated, if you're concerned, if you're stressed, it means you're in a part and it means you're you've been triggered into that part. So you can ask yourself, well, how did this start? What triggered me into this part? What was the, now listen carefully here, what was the environmental stimuli? What was the sensory information that I interpreted and, and how did I interpret it? How did I actually misinterpret it in such a way that led to this part, this program, becoming active and dominant in my energy system? And I'd like to add to that because it's very important. And, and, and we, we really, in this workshop, we wanted to talk about triggering because it's so important because... Uh, triggering is a sign of unconsciousness. When we get triggered, we're definitely in a program. And the challenge with that is once you're in a program, you, you can't know you're in a program. It's not until later on maybe that you can realize, oh, I got triggered into... That said, when you're in it, in that moment, even if it's just for one second, when you're angry, when you're sad, when you're uh, resentful, when you're... Whatever emotion comes up, whatever negative thought comes up in your consciousness in that moment you're in a program and you can't see what is you you're just repeating you're just like a skipping record just repeating something that you've learned so the reason i'm bringing this up is because uh it's very important to work on those triggers on those programs preemptively preventatively before they occur so that you can start mapping them. Because when you're in the emotions, when you're emotionally charged, when you're reacting, when you're in that reactive cycle period, and the longer it lasts, the more it tends to get um, anchored and it becomes an addiction. We become addicted to those, you know, those reactions, those emotions. So when, when you're there, you, you can't really uh, navigate it. You can't really see where you are. It's kind of like you're in the valley and you're, you can't see the path. Whereas when you're, you know, not triggered and you're maybe on top of the mountain and maybe you can see, oh, in these moments I take this path. And there's another path because you're not triggered. You're not emotionally charged. You're not in the illusion, in the samsara of your emotion and therefore resonating in that energy and not being able to see and perceive reality. So then when you're on the mountaintop, preemptively working on your triggers, then you can see, oh, I've been taking this path. Every time this sensory stimuli comes up, I go into this program. Oh, and I end up in this you know, situation that is really detrimental and, and painful and, and non-optimal. And, and I really, I don't want to take this path anymore. And then you can see, well, what are my other options? And from the top of the mountain, you can see many paths. You can see many ways in which you could go. And so then you, you, once you've anchored that, now you have a grounding perspective for those moments where the triggers come up. And then you can remember, wait, oh, I'm, I'm, I remember this. <laughs> yeah. And not get lost because right. you know the path. You know, oh, this path is going to take me down the, you know, not where I want to go. And now I know I can go down another path that brings me into a state of peace, into a state of calm, into a state of well-being, of connection, of, of love, of kindness, compassion, patience. So I'm going to take this path because I know it, because I've practiced it. 
because pre preemptive, preventative uh, mapping of your triggers is you practicing a new way, a new way, and in re learning to respond instead of react. And to just add, to, yes, Anne, it's so good to be calm and breathe and stop and be present. And, and just to uh, add to, to Alessandrina's metaphor there, uh, it can be like the, the mountain, in the mountaintop, we can see where we've come from, clearly. We can see the path we've taken, right, to get here. And we can see where we're going in the distance. And so that means that we, we respond according to our, our deepest, most heartfelt and truest soul intentions. So it means that if, if we're in the valley, right, of the, you know, the valley, the deep part of the, the mountain, and we look up, we can't see anything. We can't see where we came from or where we're going really, because you're in a valley. And all you see around you are the towering walls of this mountain. The towering walls, that's what you see. And, and when we're unconscious, it is our ego that gets projected onto these, the walls of the valley. And so we see not, you know, what our partner really said to us and how our partner really feels and that our partner is in pain and afraid. What we see is that our partner is bad and wrong and saying bad things about us and not loving us and not caring about us. And we project this onto the walls of the mountain, of, of the valley. And, and that's what we think is going on. Yeah, and same thing with work, right? Someone brought up work earlier on. Uh, instead of seeing creatively what's possible, I'll take a metaphor uh, that I heard um, Elon Musk uh, in an interview say. Someone asked him at the beginning when he was starting to work with, uh, with uh, electric cars. They said, well, how do, you, how do you think you're going to be able to achieve the same speeds that you know, um, the cars that run on gas you know, can achieve? And um, so really challenging him and saying, you know, it's not been done before. So how are you going to do that? And Elon Musk simply said, we'll figure it out. So the energy of the solution, right? Instead of the energy of the walls where you're projecting all the, the potential um, uh, failures, the potential for uh, disappointment, for things not being the way that you want them to be, really focusing um, on, on the energy of the solution and figuring things out and being creative. Which brings up another important aspect of consciousness. There is an aspect of faith to consciousness. Elon Musk saying, we'll figure it out. He's on the mountaintop. He's saying, look how far we've come. Look at all the things we have figured out. When we spend our energy and intention and attention on things, we tend to find creative solutions. So I imagine that we'll have that in the future. And so for all of you asking, well, how do I clear this? How do I let go of ego? Well, obviously, we can't give you one, one answer today. If we could, you know, the, the whole world would be enlightened. And, and the process of deconstructing ego is, is a gradual process. The process of becoming conscious is a gradual process. And, and, and it's a worthy process and a worthwhile process and a fruitful process. And any parts of us that are trying to get it done, like, just like we might get fast food, any part that thinks that we can become conscious and enlightened as fast as we can go out and, and get a burger is not, uh, is not conscious and is therefore affecting us and our process. And, and we started the workshop with, uh, you know, a little grounding meditation to connecting you to your, your intention. The way to do it is it starts with your intention. That in itself is so precious. And, and it continues with your intention so if you sustain it. Fo focusing over and over again, coming back to your intention. And when you've come into a program, coming back and coming back. And that's a process. And find, find the source. There's a lot of information. Alessandrina and I have literally like years of, of things to share with you. And, and so, so find for you the teachers that can help you and, and learn as much as you can from them. And that might be us and it might not be. Yeah, and, and, and a teacher is going to point you in the direction of consciousness. And then what's important is that you yourself allow yourself, and, and that's one, one of the reasons why we love Jiddu Krishna, Krishnamurti so much is that any time that you see him talk, he's, he's exploring. He's really allowing himself to uncover each question as it arises 
without applying his intellect, his mind to it, is really in the moment with each word, with each question as it arises and, and exploring it. And so intention and focus and alignment, realigning yourself with that intention and that focus over and over and over again. It, like unwavering focus and intention. Like we have uh, over here, it's hard because we can see ourselves, right? Uh, because it's reflected back to us and, and we do our best to look at you. And in this case, you are a green dot because uh, next to our webcam on this laptop, there's a little green dot that shows that the camera's on. And so if we look at that green dot, then we know we're looking at you. And, and what's interesting is that a conscious teacher shared with us a practice of to practice single pointed focus. And, and the practice was that you put a green dot on a piece of paper and you stare at it. And you do nothing else. You just stare at it. And once you can develop single pointed focus, then what happens when you turn that single pointed focus to consciousness? Then you are conscious more. And what prevents us from that is our parts getting triggered, our ego coming up. And so then it's about releasing these over and over and over again until there's nothing left. So learning to clear heal and release ego parts, learning to clear heal and release unconsciousness, learning to clear heal and release all fear, belief, expectation and judgment which is all what the ego is made up of and all that the subconscious is made up of because the ego is unconscious it's subconscious it's not real and we experience it as real because we have these recordings and and we're identified as a as a personality as you know a person with habits and and patterns and 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 we believe ourselves to be you know, we or me, <laughs> like Alessandrina or Dexter. So learning to clear, heal, and release all things that we identify with, including ourselves, to think that, oh, I'm Dexter and Dexter is, is, is someone. What, De Dexter is imagined. Dexter doesn't exist. Dexter, who is Dexter? A, 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 an accumulation of interpretations, Similar of experiences, recordings, recordings uh, symbols that, that we've associated, a web of associations. If we, could, if we could simplify everything into being... So, so let's start at this. The very basic experience is not truly an experience uh, in, in reality. It is us seeing things, hearing things, feeling things, and then... Uh, tasting things, right? And then interpreting all of that stimuli into a story. And 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 then and then recording that and 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 making a and then taking a bunch of those different recorded interpretations of experiences which which we languageify, right? We turn it into language. We say, "Oh, this happened and that happened and this happened with Dexter and this happened with Alessandrina." And, and I felt bad about it. And I felt this, these pains here and stress. And, and this is what it felt like. So we remember like the, the feelings. We remember the language that we put to it. And we remember these supposedly like things that exist, like Dexter and, and, and a place like the United States or whatever. And we combine all these things into this, this neural sort of web of associations. A web of associations. And this web of associations is what we unconsciously refer to as reality. But it is not. It's not reality. It is a sort of mental map that we've made of reality. And if you've heard the saying, to, to, to mistake the map for the territory. I think that's the saying. It's when you get mm -hmm. so caught up in your model, your mental model, your belief system, your idea of what is happening, that you actually lose sight of what is really happening. And, and we've all been essentially conditioned to live like that, to operate like that, and, and to hold on to this big web of associations, this big web of, of beliefs and fears and, 
and expectations and judgments and what's good and what's bad and what's right and what's wrong and what will lead to success and what won't lead to success and what is a good partner and what's not, what is love and what isn't. And, and then we try to carry all that, right? We carry all of it and it's so heavy and it's so, it's so much maintenance to keep this web of associations intact and consistent and it's, it's so much work. It creates so much thought and stress and, and, and we... it contracts us. So we're now becoming like our, our experience of reality is actually this composite, this, all of these different things that we put in this bag or in this, you know, this, this bubble. And, and we're living in that contracted instead of expanding into consciousness, into reality. And as we expand now, really experiencing consciousness through that process of expanding into the field. So in addition to releasing, uh, to clearing, to letting go of ego, to um, uncovering and then resolving uh, what is in the subconscious that is influencing us from moment to moment, the beginning meditation that we did where you connected to consciousness, to the light of consciousness, any time that you connect to this light, that you connect, however you connect to it, it doesn't have to be a visual process. Anytime that you allow yourself to be filled with this light, to connect to it, to explore it, to know it, to become familiar with it, you are becoming more conscious. You are not operating from the subconscious mind as much because you are choosing, instead of being, you know, this uh, amalgam of all these different parts and obscurations and programs, you are choosing to shine the light of consciousness in your own being and to let that light inform you, to let that light help you connect in the present moment to what is. Thank you, Darren. Love you too. And thank you, B, who said, well said, teachers. Um, we have a question from Kathleen. Is now a good time? Yeah. Did you feel you finished with that? Yes. Okay. So. Kathleen asks, how do you maintain all of what you're saying while still setting boundaries? Well, that's interesting. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. So say we're trying to maintain love and light in our systems and to remain conscious and to remain still and to have a still mind and to be at peace and to be present. And then we think of something. Well, that thing, and it's, it's a painful memory or, or this thing that we don't want to do that we feel we have to do. Or even just something that we feel we have to do that has, in a sense, taken us out of our space of presence and inner peace. Well, that thing has entered our sovereign space. Right? Because now we're experiencing it. So, say that this thing was something that someone asked you to do. Well, perhaps their energy is entering your sovereign space. And perhaps that's a, a, a time to realize, to, to learn, to discover, oh, wow, I've, I am letting this person's energy into my sovereign space. And it is, it is taking over some part of me, in a sense. And I am, I'm, it is causing me to be unconscious. So then you can ask yourself, what do you do then? Do you say, oh, well, you know, that's a bad person. I got to blame them. I got to kick them out of my life. <laughs> or do you say, so there must be some part of me, which I don't yet fully understand, that is in some way either fearing something or believing something or expecting something of myself, for example, or judging something, like judging myself if I don't do this for them. Uh, or wanting something, right? Or not wanting something, so attached or averse. So what part is this? And, and if you're really willing to be disciplined in this way and to discover these parts of yourself at, for as long as, you, as they're there, meaning never getting to a point where you're saying, okay, I've found them all, I've done all this work, I don't have any fears anymore, so never going there. <laughs> Simply being open to at any time discovering another part if it interferes with your consciousness. This guarantees that you'll be thorough and you will be complete in your process of creating a clean and clear sovereign space where you 
can exist and experience consciousness from. And I'd like to add something to that. Uh, for those of you who are resonant with mantras, especially Sanskrit mantras, we have some on Inside Timer, uh, they are different mantras that, that can do several things. Uh, some mantras can raise your, your um, vibration, your energy, can es essentially help you resonate with higher states of consciousness, so with, with you know, consciousness at a high level. And so um, such mantras can be very uh, useful, supportive of that process of becoming more conscious. There are other mantras, for instance, the Ganesha mantra, is a mantra to remove obstacles. So if you wanted to become more conscious, when you did your mantra practice with Ganesha, for instance, you could ask that any obstacles, any blocks to being more conscious be released through the application, through the practice of this mantra. And what would happen is that anything in your system that's not internally aligned with being conscious would come up through this practice and would become aligned as a result of that. So in addition to that, there's also talking about boundaries and energies that influence you and contract you because when you receive energies and, you, and you're not in this state of expansion, those energies tend to, to lead you to feel contracted and to, to receive those energies in a way that you are not influenced by them, not in a conscious way. So there's a mantra, Shamondaye, for instance. Shamondaye is a mantra that helps you to really create this, um, this field of energy where you become more self-sovereign. There is protection against less conscious energies, more detrimental um, energies that may have their own um, agenda. <laughs> and, and so that you, when you do this mantra, you become less resonant with those, res, less resonant with those energies and you become more self-sovereign and you have stronger boundaries. Again, boundaries doesn't mean that you're closing yourself up to the world. It means that you consciously are aware of your soul's intentions and what you're choosing to um, to bring into the world and to create it in the world and to experience in the world and whatever energy is coming from the collective consciousness, your family, your parents, your friends or any uh, group uh, you know in society in the world that wants to influence you that you consciously become aware of that and you choose do I want to participate in this energy or not is it in my highest and best good is it in the world's highest and best good is this something that you know is going to to be uh, aligned with my soul's intention or not and if it's not but again when you do the mantra those energies become to 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 they become less uh, of an influence and you begin to release them from your field so yeah. that's so we just, very important. We just put, put it in here. The mantra is Om Aim Hrim Klim Chamundaye Vishe Namaha. And then Om Gom Glom Ganapate Namaha. And that's another the... one, Ganesha. And there's many mantras that can be used. And, and if you don't want to use the Sanskrit mantra, which has many benefits, you can use another type of mantra like I am supreme consciousness now. And as you recite that, you can imagine your aura filled with light that comes down from above and go and, and surrounds you in a yeah, positive and feels, energy space. And feels your entire being. So I am supreme consciousness or supreme God consciousness, if that resonates with you, uh, in every part of my being. And we do want to say that when we use the word God, uh, we're not talking about God from a religious we're perspective. Speaking of all that is. From, the, from the, the vantage point that all that is is good, all that is is beautiful, all that is is divinely intelligent, all that is is working towards some greater purpose that we don't can't comprehend. And is that, is that, yeah, that's... So if we could just say one quick example, as you're holding that space, I saw a question that asked, you know, what if you're speaking with a narcissist or what if... So it's how do you hold that space with someone else that's really difficult to, to hold it with? Well, truly, that is that is up to you. Because if when you're speaking to someone and they could be yelling at you 
or the, if you're just constantly and trying and having the intention of, of energetically uh, affecting you yes mm -hmm. and 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 that their reality is the greater reality that it's more important than your reality right right and that they're more right <laughs> you can you can can just just in such focus I am supreme consciousness now and you can listen you can listen to them and hear them from that conscious space and from there you'll have so much information you'll have so much more clarity with which you can navigate and if I can add and that was another uh, aspect that's important to understand the more again going back to the preventative and the the proactive preemptive um, the more you anchor that energy of consciousness the more you allow yourself to be conscious and to bring that consciousness back into your being into your body and to understand what that means the more in those moments where you know there might be energies uh attempting to influence you the more because you've you familiarize yourself and you've grounded the energy in your being um uh, in all levels of your chakras essentially uh, the more you will be able to stay in that energy rather than waver and be influenced by external energies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can create around yourself with intention practice and energy a positive pressure environment which is like if you know those hospital rooms where they do surgery if you were to to put your hand by the the, the underneath the door you would feel air coming out Right? And, and the reason is that they're pumping so much air into the room that it's a positive pressure environment. That air is constantly trying to leave the room. And what that does is it prevents particles from the outside environment from entering that sacred space or that, in this case, sterile space. Right, So you can create a positive pressure environment so that there's constantly light and positive energy flowing out from you and that when any negative energy tries to get in, it can't get in because of that positive pressure environment. Just like if you've seen Star Wars or another space movie, the force field that exists around the ship as it moves through a bunch of asteroids or an asteroid belt, the, the, as the, the, the space rocks hit the force field, they dissolve and the space rocks never actually hit the ship. So if I may, if we may answer some questions. Yes, and I, I do want to say uh, that probably over the next month I'll be releasing, I'm working right now on a meditation on boundaries and self-sovereignty. So, Yeah, and, and it is our intention to provide you with like so much information to help you in the, with this ego deconstruction process, with this process of being conscious, with this process of loving your life. And... And so one way to, to get more is to continue to watch our workshops and to any other content that we produce, if you want to. Uh, let me address a question from actually early on in the workshop from Anne, which was, uh, so the thoughts that come into our mind, and I'm doing this from memory because the, I can't see those comments anymore. It was, are they all basically like what ifs? And yes, when we leave the, the present moment and whenever we think, you know, well, what if this? Well, what if that? It is a process of leaving the present moment and of getting pulled into the past or the future in, in a way, potentially in an unconscious way. Yeah. That, that, one second, my love. That doesn't mean that you can't consciously reflect on the past or that you can't consciously reflect on the future. Of course, that is good and possible. So when, when we create this what if, or if this, then that, where you, we're pulling information, where we're, whether we're aware of it or not, we're pulling information from past situations that we've experienced or other people that we know have experienced or things that we've read or seen on television or that we've become aware of or things from our past lives, uh, whether, again, we're aware of them or not. Uh, that come through that you know we receive those energies and now they inform us of all the different worst case scenarios or negative scenarios that could unfold and we start going into this process of of um, assessing and trying to understand and project all the negative things that could happen and then try to uh, rescue ourselves out of them save ourselves out of them and we can spend a lot of energy it can be very draining to do that 
all these what ifs because we can go into many different tangents of all the different realities that we don't want to happen instead of being one pointedly focused on what we do want to you know to to experience or one pointedly focused simply on being present and aware and conscious and receiving the moment and whatever happens like for instance uh, michael singer um wrote a book called the surrender experiment where he basically uh, chose that whatever came into his life, he would just say yes to everything that came into his life. Which is, we're not suggesting. No, that. we're not saying that. And it was an experiment of simply just whatever came into his realm of experience, he said yes to. And so where that took him and, and then the next and then the next. And of course, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else because we can't be everywhere at once. So it's 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 not something to take in a black and white way yeah and it doesn't mean saying yes to everything doesn't mean being conscious <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't and that he did call it the you know the, the surrender experiment so just surrendering and and experimenting with that we have a few questions here on on dreams what about bad dreams while i sleep while, while asleep, says Mary. And Heather says, I'm also wondering about bad dreams. Would you like to talk about that? Well, I, I can begin to, to share some insights about dreams. Uh, essentially, like I said earlier on, when the subconscious is clear, the subconscious mind is clear, which can take you know, thousands or more than thousands of lifetimes. It depends on your, you know, your own um, karmas and what you're learning and processing and understanding. So the when the subconscious mind is clear, there's no dream. It's a dreamless state. And so when we dream, basically what we're doing is we're reconciling things uh, in our subconscious that are as of yet unresolved. Emotions, situations, circumstances, relationship dynamics, fears, beliefs, um, judgments, um, and of course, in a, in a very creative way, meaning that it doesn't necessarily look like what we're actually resolving until we start to really understand the way that the subconscious mind works. And then when we dream and we remember our dreams, we start to kind of understand, oh, I was processing this, my fear of this, or I was processing this conflict that I had 10 years ago, or this relationship um, dynamic that I experience with uh, five different people so the dream state uh, is a a realm where we're really reconciling what's as of yet unresolved so it's a wonderful thing especially when it's done consciously to observe to even journal about it to start to even before going to bed clearing as much as you can before you go to bed so that you can have more rest and also intending to be very conscious like we you know there's the techniques like lucid dreaming for instance where you can really uh, start to understand and be a, an active protagonist in your dream state instead of passively receiving this information and and sometimes in a way that can feel uh, a bit intense and, and a bit confusing because the realm of dream is, you know, it has archetypes, it has symbols, it has, it, it doesn't uh, function the way that the analytical mind looks at reality. It's not in linear time. It pulls from many different sources. So it can feel confusing. And when you intentionally uh, choose to understand your dreams, to clear as much uh, in the state of dreaming, then your your nights can be more restful, and you it doesn't have to be problematic. You don't have to look at your dreams or or nightmares as a problem. It's a process of purging the subconscious, of clearing the subconscious. And if I could add to that, in your process of self awareness and self discovery and of becoming more conscious, it. This is a this is a nuance, and it's a it's a big nuance. Of, of being humble. So when you introspect on your dreams, rather than saying, "Oh well, you know, I dreamt about this, and I know it means that," or "I know it means this about me," or to one of the things that the most conscious beings on earth have consistently said 
is that they know nothing. And that knowing nothing is a prerequisite to consciousness. Which is very interesting because in society, uh, up until now, in many different realms, it's been said that knowledge is power. <laughs> so it depends what we're talking about. If we're talking about consciousness, and I wouldn't even say that it's power, uh, knowledge, which is the recording of the past, the repetition of the past, the, the continuation of the past, is not power. And a lot of people imagine that because they know they can use that as a, as a way to gain power. And then to get what they want in the world, which means that they're working from attachment and aversion and ego and not consciousness. And a misapprehension of not being safe in the world, which then right. leads to wanting to accumulate knowledge and in power. order to feel yeah. powerful and yeah. not so unsafe. So, so to be conscious is to, to not just feel safe. And this is a big one to go beyond feeling safe, to go beyond the idea of safety, to go, and yes, Wendy, thank you for adding that, uh, lack, to go beyond the idea of having and not having, of lacking and having, of safety and, and not safety, to go beyond all of that. It, and if you think about this carefully, is it really a nice life to feel safe? And, and it sounds like yes, but if you're really, if you're there and you're like, oh yes, I'm feeling safe. Okay, I'm feeling safe now. I'm feeling safe now. Isn't that actually still a process of carrying fear? So isn't any attachment to safety a reflection that we're still carrying fear? And in this process, when Dexter's talking about safety, he's talking about safety as a state that is dependent on on a certain um, environmental uh, certain environmental conditions right. especially instead of experiencing feeling safe not feeling safe as in i'm safe because and then a list of things that you know explain why i'm safe really ex feeling safe in the sense of um, really being grounded uh, in your body and in your soul in the knowledge that you are an eternal being that was never born and will never die and therefore there's nothing to feel safe or unsafe about thank you wendy for 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 saying wow and, and considering this seriously and deeply and thank you darren for also uh and and darren feels that he needs to hear this and wow what a way to look at it it's so wonderful to be able to talk to other souls who are taking this in a way seriously and also having fun with it and, and applying it to themselves. And, and it is very rewarding. This, 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 just this, this part of this workshop is very rewarding because once you realize this, then there's so much freedom that comes from it. You can literally, excuse me, Matt, orient yourself in a different direction and aim for a different star. Because most people today even when they speak of consciousness, even when they speak of spirituality, even when they speak of love, what they're really talking about, if truly, is safety. And they're seeking safety. And that's, that search for safety is coming from fear. And so it's a contracted state. It's a state that's not creative, where the energy and all of your being and your consciousness is, is applied to how can I be safe? How can I be safe? Control strategy, safety strategy after safety strategy instead of experiencing the world and, and allowing for the flow of energy to go wherever it goes and, and, and having this freedom that Dexter is describing and this expansion of your being. And so uh, B says, yes, phenomenal, thank you, with a beautiful butterfly, which is wonderful because... Imagine as in our lives, as we are unconscious, as we are identified with our ego and experiencing all of the pain and all of the suffering and the fear and the sadness and the anger and the wanting, right? The endless desiring of things we don't have. As we are in that ego dynamic, imagining that, imagining ourselves and then, and then trying to live in that world that we've imagined rather than being here, 
we are like the caterpillar. And, and once we realize, oh my gosh, you know, almost I've been living life from moment to moment seeking safety, which is an illusion because my death is an illusion because I, this I that I think about and all the thoughts that I have around it is an illusion. And everything that I'm associated with is an illusion. Then we can become the butterfly and be free of that illusion and, and reorient ourselves, aim for this star of consciousness, the star of being free from all attachments, all anchors, being free from all illusion, and experience a peace that has nothing to do with our physical body, with our house, with the people around us, protecting us, uh, with having enough money, a peace that is beyond all of that, a peace that is greater and consistent and independent and truly unconditional. Which, which reminds me, uh, someone asked, you know what, so, so is this about, uh, about halfway through this workshop, I saw a question that said, is this about like reconditioning ourselves? And, and actually it's not about reconditioning. It's about deconditioning so that there are no more conditions. There are no more programs so that the consciousness, the inner peace, the love, the light of our soul can be unconditional. It doesn't matter if it's raining outside. It doesn't matter if we don't get what we want. It doesn't matter if our partner is upset one day and speaks to us. It doesn't matter if our partner doesn't see this or that. We have our peace. We have our light. And that light is shining. And with it, we can see that everyone around us is doing their best, that everyone around us is a child of God on their own journey, on their own learning process, in their own process of evolving to the light. And from there, we can operate with everyone in such a way that we see every moment and every interaction as an opportunity. Because if we can truly see that all that is happening here is, is, a, is a wonderful and beautiful process, greater than we can fathom. And, and we can free ourselves from our ego and be conscious in every moment, then all there is left to do is to benefit, to benefit ourselves and to benefit others from this miraculous, multidimensional opportunity, which we could call the process of God, for example, unfolding. So, so to be conscious, in a way, is to become totally free from all problems and all ideas and beliefs that we have previously identified with. And that is a major transformation. So shall we close with a meditation, a short meditation? Yeah. Wonderful. So we're going to guide you through a short meditation, um, bringing you to the back of your heart, connecting you to uh, the state of consciousness that you can perceive from there and uh, inviting you to explore that with us. Go ahead then. So if you would close your eyes and relax. And bring your attention, your awareness, to a, a very still place behind your heart. A space of calm, a space of love behind your heart. And if you would go there and be there and stay there for the duration of this meditation, 
And any time that your attention wavers, that you find yourself thinking, that you, saw, you find yourself in the past connecting to something other than being in the back of your heart, you can notice it and choose non-judgmentally, lovingly, to bring your awareness back to the back of your heart. Over and over and over again, practicing this focus, this intentionality. And this, this space is where your soul consciousness enters your being, enters your physical body, and your energy system for this lifetime. And from this place, you have access to a wonderful, expansive love and intelligence from your soul and its consciousness. So if you let yourself from this space become aware of light, light energy flowing from the back of your heart into your heart light of your soul, the light of consciousness, the light of spirit, whether you see it visually, whether you experience it, you sense it, it's feeling this light moving through the back of your heart into your heart, into your being. and connecting to the qualities of this light, whatever they are for you. Connecting to a feeling of expansion and openness as you feel this light, as you see this light, as you explore it, as you become familiar with it. Sensing it, feeling every space within your body, feeling your mind, your emotions. Shining the light of consciousness throughout your entire being. Feeling the unconditional love that flows from this light. Feeling how this light sees all beings and things as equal. Feeling how this light loves all beings and things equally when they are in pain, when they're in suffering, and when they are in, and in their happiest moments also. But this light is constantly, universally loving, forgiving, and accepting of all. And feeling the, the stillness and silence and consistency of this light, that it is in peace, and that it brings peace and calm to everything it touches. And that it welcomes all. as you continue to invite this light, the light of consciousness within your being, exploring it. Notice any changes in your body, how much more relaxed your body may have become. The stillness in your mind. Maybe you have less thoughts or no thoughts. The silence, 
the expansion, the openness, let yourself explore that, feel that. And as you continue to receive and to feel and to resonate with the light of consciousness, the light of your soul, if you'll repeat mentally or out loud, I am supreme consciousness in every part of my being right now. I am supreme consciousness in every part of my being right now. And feel that. I am supreme consciousness in every part of my being right now. I am supreme loving consciousness in every part of my being right now. Connecting to this love in all parts of your being. Allowing this love and light and consciousness to dispel all darkness, all ignorance, all obscuration, all misunderstanding, all worries, all stress, completely annihilated in the light of this consciousness. So that you may feel more present, more light. free and untethered, non-attached. Surrounded by light. That your whole existence in this moment is light and is the light. That that is who you are in this moment. Simply the light and that it fills everything and there is nothing other than the light and seeing or feeling this light shine through you from you onto all of your relationships onto all objects all situations all circumstances all times past present future all dimensions and feeling what it feels like to face your relationships and your life in this light and how they are different and how this light informs you differently and in a way helps you understand and feel that Everything is fine. And everything is good. And anchoring this consciousness all the way into your feet and into the center of the earth. Allowing for the light to fill all time, all space, all dimensions in this moment in time. Allowing yourself to be fully resonant, fully aligned with the light, with consciousness. Dissolving and releasing and healing and integrating anything that is not in alignment. And 
feeling deeply grateful for this experience within yourself. And intending for all beings, all sentient beings, all things, the planet, the universe, the galaxy, all universes and galaxies to be filled with the light of consciousness, embodying, resonating, echoing consciousness within you and all around you, into all of what you know and also all of the unknown. Feeling so grateful for this experience and your intention and your resonance with the light. And bringing your hands to your heart and anchoring this experience, this gratitude into your being so that you can remember what it feels like. And as you do, blessing every being on earth, blessing everything, everything that has ever happened, good and bad, blessing it all. Known and unknown. Blessing all possibilities, all relationships, all animals, all people, all rocks and earth and trees and insects, blessing everything. So that this light might also shine on them, through them. So that all darkness might be dispelled. Blessing all that we are truly one with and bringing light to our entire being entire being and process of God. And right. being a conscious component in this process. And recognizing our oneness in consciousness, in the light. And the everlasting truth of this. That in this truth will be here for you in all future situations, struggles, misunderstandings, this truth is here for you always. If you'll take a slow breath, deepening your breath, coming back into this space and time with this energy, with this light, in consciousness, in oneness, in wholeness. And when you're ready, you can gently and lovingly open your eyes. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this experience with us. Yes, thank you. And um, if you enjoy the workshop, please donate uh, for us and for Insight Timer. We appreciate your donations, your generosity. Yes. And um, it's been so nice to have this back and forth with so you, wonderful. You, you very intelligent souls. And, and thank you for your excellent comments and questions. And, and it is our intention, this is a, such a small fraction of, of the, the many enlightening and helpful things that we've learned that we would love to share with you. And so if you stay connected to our work, you will find that we will be providing a, a lot of hopefully very helpful things that, that you connect with deeply and that bring more love and light into your, to your heart, to your soul, and to your life. 
And uh, usually we announce uh, new workshops at the end of each workshop that we do. We do have a workshop in two weeks. We haven't decided what it's going to be about. And the reason for that is we wanted your input. So if there is something uh, that you want to talk about, that you want us to bring up and, and explore together, please let us know. Uh, we're open to your suggestions. Uh, you can leave them here right now in the comment section or you can also, through our website, you can contact us and let us know what you'd like us to, to talk about. We'll be, for the time being, continuing these workshops uh, pretty much every two weeks. And um, so let us know what you want to talk about, what you'd like to explore. And Mary says thank you. Juan says thank you so, so much. B says thank you both. Heather says thank you. Wendy says I appreciate you. Sally says thank you so much. Wendy says I'm glad I found you today. We're glad to meet you today and that we were able to connect with you. T says thank you for keeping up with the questions. We try. <laughs> we try. We'll do better next time in the, in the beginning there. We may have missed a few. Uh, mindfulness in relations and triggers. Uh, yes, mindfulness in relationships and triggers. Okay. And, and if, if that is a, a topic that is of interest, we did have a workshop on conscious, cultivating conscious relationships uh, on Insight Timer and also on triggers and what to do when you get triggered. And we record all of our workshops so they become available um, for you to, to enjoy. So you can visit us on our website and find that. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Love and light to all of you. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. And many blessings. Much love.